So I think there's a mismatch between perceptions and reality about where some of the technology is in terms of, of different energy sources, right? So, you know, something, you know, like three quarters of, of global energy comes from hydrocarbons. Uh, and then the rest, you know, uh, hydro and nuclear are big chunks and only something like 5% is wind and solar. Uh, but as wind and solar have, have kind of been pushed uh, to be, be larger and larger parts of the grid. And there are there are certainly applications where they're useful. There's very there's very hot and dry regions of the world. Uh, you know, rooftop solar can can give you kind of more autonomy from the local grid if you have say rooftop solar and a battery backup, for example. So, but as they've kind of um put policies ahead of technology, uh, and you kind of like you know obfuscate the costs, overstate the strengths, and and, and get that into the grid, it, it it's you know kind of caused some issues. There's also a challenge where you know, there's not a lot of investment in the grid itself, right? So, for example, California keeps having their electrical grid, you know, parts of the electrical grid face rolling brownouts. Uh, and and you can imagine if if you were to, say, 10x the number of electrical vehicles that are drawing power from that grid instead of through the gasoline distribution system we have, right? That's all now, if that starts going over the grid, that's more stress on the grid. You need more copper, you need more redundancy, you need more cables bringing that around. Uh, and so I think the short term way out of this is frankly just there needs to be more supply of hydrocarbons, natural gas, uh, uh, oil and coal, uh, because that, that's what the world's currently short of, uh, especially in certain locations. Longer term, you know, I'd like to see a nuclear renaissance, uh, you know, combination of smaller reactors and a, a better regulatory environment could really make nuclear come back. I mean, decades ago, it was actually pretty cheap and quick to build a nuclear plant. Um, as, as there've been a handful of accidents, um, which, you know, there's actually, even if you add up all those accidents, the number of, even if you take the worst case scenario of not just immediate deaths, which was very, very few, but if you kind of uh, take the high end estimates for environmental damage and, and what that could have caused, uh, you know, kind of in the region, you know, it's, it's like it killed fewer people than coal kills, like, you know, every year, for example, uh, through particulates in the air, but nuclear got that kind of, um, increasing regulatory burden. And that now makes it almost impossible in many places of the world to build a new nuclear facility. Um, and of course, you want like safe operation. So for example, part of why Chernobyl was so bad is they didn't even have like the, the shield uh, that now is standard practice among the nuclear facilities. And, and so there are obviously, there's really bad ways to build a nuclear facility, but you know, the modern ways and, and, and back then even the, the responsible ways can build safe nuclear uh, and so I'd like to see that combination of, of you know, they, they've developed small modular reactors. Uh, that's That's been a bit like a push lately. And if there were kind of easing regulatory environment, I think that nuclear can can at least solve a lot of the baseload grid power. And then longer term, you know, there's, there's interesting things like, you know, ocean thermal energy uh, that I think is underexplored. You know, there, there are other ways to get baseload power, but the, the general thing you need is that you need to have nature do as much of the storage and concentration as possible, because the more that you have to replicate with machines, you know, the less efficient and energy dense that's going to be. Um, and so I think that's the big theme that a lot of people are, are missing in the energy space.